Uh, joining me today, returning to the podcast for the first time since the Edinburgh TV Festival uh, last year, is Ian Rumsey, Director of ITM Productions. Hi, Ian. Good to see you. Uh, it's lovely to see you too. Um, uh, the new cycle doesn't seem to be getting any any slower, does it? Keeps on speeding up, keeps on speeding up. Oh. And uh, it's, you know, it's a relentless cycle. Uh, and a busy week for you guys. Yeah, uh, it's been a very busy week in in news. There is a lot going on from uh, Harry and Meghan and uh, <laughs> the car chase to um, Ukraine and Zelensky and the Prime Minister's visit to Japan. It's, you know, it's it's constantly shifting. And most importantly, an awards win. Yeah, Channel 4 News, a BAFTA win for um, their programme uh, from the Ukraine, which all of ITN are really proud about. It was a... It was a fantastic show and an amazing win. And um, the Channel 4 News team thoroughly deserved. And a great speech by Matt Fry, mm. I would say, as well. He really he really did a great speech. Um, so yeah, so, you know, fantastic. A well-deserved BAFTA. Some would say not all of the BAFTAs <laughs> went to the right people, but that one absolutely did. So we might talk about that a bit later. Uh, also with us, uh, he's a commercial strategy manager at the BBC, but his views are his own. It's Adam Bowie. <laughs> Um, it's a busy week in your in in your world, but also you're kind of uh, like me. You have stumbled into sort of a radar expert hole, which you yeah, keep having my to... little weird side hustle of uh, radar. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think we'll talk about it later. But um, yeah, it's, it's, there's been a lot of numbers coming out recently with some Midas data and the uh, Ofcom doing some podcast research not too long ago. So those, aside from my day to day job, have been <laughs> keeping me busy. Uh, so if we think about Rajah, before we get into the details, in the day-to-day -day style, uh, uh, if you could sum up Rajah in one word, what would it be? Uh, great for commercial radio. Okay, that, that's more than one word, but I'll, I'll let you off. Uh, <laughs> right, okay, so the BBC have unveiled a new project on Wednesday, uh, BBC Verify, uh, which promises radical transparency. Um, Adam, have you looked at this? How, how's it, how's it going to work? Yeah, I think it's it's been Deborah Turnis's big new venture I think and it's um, it's pulling together a, a bunch of things that probably have existed a bit in places but sort of bring them together giving them a name I think giving them something that the audience can look for so you know for example you know the Ros Atkins uh, videos which are explainer videos which have been going on which isn't quite the same thing but that that stretches into it and I think it's just sort of it's pulling together some of that data and analysis some of that disinformation side of things which I think is a real issue not just in the UK but globally um, and just and the verification you know there's a lot of video out there there's a lot of social media stuff and and it's it's really clever some of the things you can do you know I, I, I sat in actually on a, a a talk from some of my colleagues you know showing what you can do with satellite data now because satellite imagery I think it used to be pretty expensive. It's still, I don't think it's cheap, but um, you can order it quite quickly. And so if you want to see what's going on, you know, on front lines of battles or whatever, getting really, really up to date and doing some smart stuff with some of that, it's um, really quite impressive. Uh, I mean, Ian, this appears to be quite an investment by the BBC. Um, do you think it'll have an, an impact on their reporting? Yeah, I mean, I, I know Deborah very well. I worked with her for a for many years, and this has always been at the heart of everything that she kind of stands for, trust and transparency. And I think that there's never been a more important time to really, really double down on eradicating misinformation, disinformation, two different things. Um, and, you know, I think in Deborah's mind, this is about pulling back the curtain a little bit. If you really want to trust us, then you need to understand everything that we do and everything that goes into journalism. Fact checking uh, has been around a long time and Channel 4 News, which we talked about mm. a few moments ago, you know, have been at the forefront of, of fact check. You know, it's so important for PSBs. I think um, Lucy Fraser was talking um, today about the importance of trusted public service content. So I think it's enormously important. Good journalism comes at a cost, but the value of it has never been more vital right now with AI, with everything that's going on. You know, knowing that you can go somewhere, knowing how how something was um, uh, was gathered, how the information was gathered, um, and that you can absolutely trust in its uh, veracity is really, really important. 
I mean, Adam, there's a bit of a sort of trust deficit from uh, some members of the public in traditional media. I mean, if you look on uh, the comments of Twitter and even more now with the, the new blue ticks on Twitter, particularly not particularly fans of, of mainstream media and actually watching Elon Musk this week be interviewed, he himself doesn't seem uh, to trust uh, a lot. Um, is it important for broadcasters to maybe even go beyond what they, they would expect they need to do to, to show their working? I think I think it, they really do. I think, you know, undoubtedly trust has gone down. I think you look at something like the Reuters Digital News Report, it does show it over time, it's shown it sort of ebbing away. Unfortunately, that's probably the sort of, you know, the fractionalisation of society to a large part and the way the world has progressed. And so you probably do need to almost like overcorrect a bit to, to really try and win back that belief because, you know, people sometimes maybe they do believe something they read online it, it is kind of curious that some complete stranger that you read some comment of online somehow that gels with you more than your own eyes and ears with something that you know that you've been brought up with quite probably in many cases there's also the confusion between taking opinion as fact we live in a world of opinionated journalism opinionated tv and radio hosts and it's very easy, I think, for people to take one person's view as their truth, if you like, and and that to become the story. Um, and separating opinion from well-sourced factual journalism is really important. I mean, they've brought together 60 journalists as part of BBC Verify, which is, which is significant. It is like 60 journalists versus the internet. I mean, it... Is it enough? Is it enough to, to be able to, to, to do the right checking or, or to, to show up this mis and disinformation? I mean, you know, how many do you need? <laughs> you, know, um, uh, you know, if you're taking on Twitter and social media, that's literally like going to every person who's got a mobile phone and saying, are you sure that what you've said is true? You have to start somewhere. 60 feels a pretty well-resourced mm. team, I would say. Um, and, you know, and hats off to them um you know it's it's really important whether you're bbc or sky or channel 4 um, or itv channel 5 you know good solid verified journalism is really important and it's really important that you know in the media bill that the playing field is is leveled so that psbs are able to do that other news this week, a broadcaster workers union, Beck2, declared an emergency over the unprecedented lack of work in the unscripted TV sector so far this year. Uh, whilst US broadcasters packed the schedule with shows requiring no writers, uh, the situation seems pretty bleak in the UK. I hadn't been really aware of this, Ian. What's what's going on? Uh, I think it's it's tight and it's getting tighter. I think all of the all of the broadcasters are feeling the pinch, and I think they've all been a bit surprised that the ad market hasn't um, hasn't picked up as quickly as they thought. Commissions are hard to come by, that's for sure. Um, I think ITM Productions, I don't want this to become an advert for us, <laughs> uh, but we've been pretty fortunate in that we... We got a lot of business in early in the year mm. and, and and we won a lot of business and, you know, the Jeremy Vine contract was extended for five years and, it's, and the show's been extended and both in the States and in the UK, we got a lot of green lights early in the year. It's a genuine thing. Now. Are you seeing what a commission are saying when, when you're going to them saying, what have you got next? And they're, they're going, not a lot. They're being incredibly cautious. They're saying, they're saying that money is tight. That, uh, that that they're hoping it picks up in quarter three and quarter four, that um, they they need to be that they're being really risk averse and they've got to double down on things that they know are going to work and things that they're going to get a lot of bang for their buck so they can be repeated that they're timeless. Um, I mean, I, I read uh, the comments from Ian Katz and Ben Frow. Um, this is uh, the, the yesterday. head of continent four and five. It, yeah, exactly. Um, they were talking yesterday. I mean, I think, you know, what Ben said is is probably true. You know, it's cyclical. We've got to ride it out. We've got to hold our nerve. Um, the commissions will come back. The market will pick up. We need to be creative. We need to think in the in the production sector of different funding models to try to get commissions. Um, and that's fine, but that's pretty tough if you're a freelance and you're looking mm. for work and people are saying that, you know, well, we might have something in a couple of months or after the summer. That's I mean, tough. I mean, Adam Ian's right, isn't he? I mean, if you're 
a runner or a producer or a director uh, suddenly seeing a load of your work or potential work disappears can be can be pretty alarming. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got friends who work in that industry, and I know how you know how hand to mouth it can be, and how you're going from contract to contract, and you know, that's a, that's a that's a tricky you know world to to step through, um, and you know, when the when these things happen, you know, it's it's really hard, and there's there's no there's no simple solution. You don't have it; it's not un, uh, in your control, mm. really. Uh, we had a, a note from a listener, Phil Smith, posted: uh, having worked in it for twenty odd years, it's clear that it's in total crisis. Hundreds of directors and editorial staff have been out of work for six plus months, and the future looks worse. I mean, I guess one of the dangers is you, know, you have to go and do something um, that people leave the sector. Do we then end up with a bit of a skills gap? when it when it comes back yeah it is a danger it really is um and you know there are a lot of talented people who may well be in that area who are thinking that they've worked in the business for a long time and the cost of living is going Mm. up people are struggling generally they've got to pay bills and there may well come a time for a lot of people where they've got a tough choice to make where they either wait it out and wait for the market to pick up um or take jobs at lower rates, or think I need to I need to get some money and I need to maybe think about something else, which would be a real shame. It would be a, it would be a real shame. In the states, it's slightly different. I've just come back from um, uh, America, as I was telling you before we started recording, and the unscripted um, world over there seems kind of open. Yes, uh, the writers' strike has kind of freed up a lot of schedules and a lot of diaries for talent and. I think there is a there is a very good market for unscripted outside of the UK. Yeah. Uh, but here, it's a pretty tough world at the moment. Yeah, it was noticeable this week. I think ABC released a, um, in the US, released a schedule that had one scripted show on it. It was, it was basically because they can't, they're not going to be able to fill it. And that's reruns of Abbott, Abbott Elementary. So the entirety of their primetime schedule from September is going to be unscripted. I There's mean, a lot of placards o- over there last mm. week. I can tell you, going into meetings, there was a lot of uh, pickets and placards. Um, the thing about them was that they were all brilliantly well written. <laughs> <laughs> all of all of the messages on the placards, you could tell, were written by writers because they were very well scripted. Uh, well, uh, thinking about money, and obviously we're, we're thinking about the people who they don't have jobs at the moment or are finding it tough. Um, the other people have been looking at some figures to make sure that, that their jobs are safe, as in the radio industry, as the new Rajar data has just come out. Um, we're going to cover this even more in our Patreon, but um, Adam, as, as we said, uh, one of your areas of expertise. Um, just having a look through the headlines, let's start with the Today programme. Uh, not great for them, down about a, a million over the year. Yeah, I think it's about 800,000. I What I would say is that was against a beginning of the... Uh, Ukraine war period yes. so if you depending which you know if you go back six months it's about 150,000 so I, I think it, you know it's undoubtedly you know it's not great and I think there's something interesting in speech radio maybe more upmarket speech radio seems to have taken a hit this time around I'm you know I'm bit of a broken record on these kind of things but I always look in slightly longer term mm. um, it's not just a single quarter so let's see what happens but yeah, when, you know, you could look at, you know, something like LBC's done fine, for example, even some of the, although they're much smaller, it's got to be said, the sort of talk radios and GB news is the radio bits mm. have done OK. Um, whereas even Times Radio hasn't done that great yeah. this time around. So yeah, Times Radio is sort of, it's sort of stuck in the, the kind of half million mark, isn't it? It sort of peaked at about 700,000 and it added Fee and Jane probably that would have been in this quarter too. Um there's a bit of me that feels it deserves more than it's getting, but maybe that's just my media liberal elite uh, com- coming through. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it is definitely a good product. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it will be interesting to see how they sort of work with it and uh, try and broaden it up. I mean, I guess, you know, they're speaking very heavily to the Times reader. I don't think mm. if, you're, if you're a reader of their online or their paper product, you're very well aware of it. I just wonder beyond that, you know, and obviously poaching people like, um, mm. you know, the, um, you know, Fee and everybody, that, that, that would be, they would, the way you would want to do it but you know as I think we all know it's not as simple as that mm. and it's not like everyone's going to oh I'll routine my dials now because my favourite podcasters have gone to Times Radio well it, it, it's difficult isn't it particularly at breakfast time Ian are you a Today programme listener in the morning I think if you're a 
serious journalist, politician, then the Today program mm. is built into your DNA. It's the it's the uh, it's the program that you kind of instinctively reach for. Um, you know, but it's got to adapt different times. It's got to it, it's got to look at you know listening habits just as we have to listen look l- and look and listen to viewing habits. Um, I, I think the Today programme will be here long after we arrive. <laughs> Maybe not you. You're, you're younger than us, younger than me, certainly. But uh, I think the Today programme, you know, is, is just a staple. Do you think today's change, they're trying to change it a little bit? Do you think they've been influenced by the arrival of, of Times Radio and they've had a look or it just kind of blunders along doing the same thing? I don't know. I mean, there's changes of staff, you know, and you get, you know, people like sort of the Amal Rajan and, mm. you know, the, the sort of the personnel and it will, you know, he sounds very different to John Humphreys, let's mm. say, sort of a few years ago. So, you know, it, it will change. I, I, you know, I think as audiences change and the expectations of audiences you know sometimes we kind of forget i think people think you grow into a radio station whereas actually radio stations tend to adapt along the way and if you listen to if we all went back and found some tapes of radio 4 (laughs) from 20 years ago we would be shocked what it actually sounded like then compared to now so yeah of course it's going to change the station that's done pretty well is boom radio so this is uh, a service uh, for the over 60s uh it was set up uh, in the middle of lockdown it's got a lot of very very heritage presenters who are doing shows from home uh, and it's 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 been put together by phil riley uh, and david lloyd who are sort of storied radio execs both of which had sort of retired uh, and were doing other things before they went oh should we have one last go at doing this and so they kind of bootstrapped it they've raised a decent uh, amount of money to support it but it's been going gangbusters hasn't it Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're up triple digits year on year. I mean, you know, it's just unheard of. And I think, you know, I was talking about some of the older listeners we'd found a dis- dropped off on some of the uh, BBC stations. Well, that is not happening with Boom Radio. In fact, Boom Radio is even picking up some 1524s. I mean, it's, <laughs> they're, they're doing really well. And um, I think they found a really cost efficient model. You mentioned they're yes. all doing it from home, so no one has to in invest in expensive studios or anything they've got bow i think it is doing their sales um the probably their biggest cost is distribution Mm. so getting out on dab and things like that but you can do that reasonably cost efficiently and i think you know they've now got the kind of numbers that will absolutely get them on agency plans which means they've got a legit business this isn't a hobby Mm. you know it might start it as a hobby they've stumbled into or not stumbled into they're really good they they've they've created something um really quite remarkable you know to the point that who knows someone could come yeah knocking at their door going hey we'll buy that from you well they're, they're basically adding a hundred thousand listeners a quarter uh which is brilliant um and I was, I was talking to them a little while ago they're spending quite a, a decent amount of money with kind of tactical money on marketing and marketing to kind of 65 pluses is things like itv3 and actually facebook where obviously a lot of 65 pluses are um and uh, that's a very cheap way of actually buying media and reaching audiences for a group that don't get advertised to with interesting products very often so they're converting that marketing into into listeners uh, so they've really sort of stumbled over a, a bit of a, a bit I of a gold mine. to start a radio station the three of us <laughs> now and really go for the 80 plus audience. <laughs> i think we could do it well, the best thing about older audiences is they listen for a really long period of time which is great for, for hours which is where commercial let's radio it. makes its money let's do it And we're back for part two. Time for some news in brief. Uh, the BAFTA TV Awards were on Sunday uh, with Channel 4's Derry Girls winning Best Scripted Comedy, uh, Best Female Performance in a Comedy Programme and also Best Comedy Writer for Lisa McGee. Um, Ian, we talked about uh, ITN's coverage of Ukraine. Um, now, Adam, I know previously you were never a fan of, of tape-delayed BAFTAs. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you looked at Adam's Twitter of, I don't know, the past 10 years, uh, you never a fan. Oh, but... To be fair, that was the film BAFTAs oh, okay. in particular, uh, that, which did go live for half an hour this year (laughs) but only half an hour you know because who wants to try and use social media to upsell your award ceremony that you're broadcasting to millions of people but you know that's not my choice just your opinion there um 
Uh, what caught your attention with the the BAFTAs this year? Um, I thought I thought mostly it was a decent set. I mean, as you say, Derry Girls did well. I personally would like to see Slow Horses, which mm. is a particular favourite of mine, uh, do a little bit better. And the really odd one to me was the international one, where it was the Dharma um, mm. uh, Ryan Murphy thing, which uh, felt a bit schlocky to me. And um, it was very pop. Don't get me wrong; it was enormously pop. I'm sure mm. it was one of Netflix's biggest hits. But I would have sort of, sort of something like the White Lotus or the Bear um, on Disney Plus mm. FX would have, would have felt to me more like better series, at least of the nominees in those categories. Uh, but you know you can't complain too much. I think across the board, I mean Sherwood maybe could have done a bit better. I think um, I sometimes wonder, you know, if something came out last summer that everyone's forgotten about it by the following. I'm not sure when the jury sat, but you know it probably wasn't that long ago. I mean, Ian, there's there's been there's a lot on television now, isn't there? There's a lot to try and capture in an award ceremony. I completely agree on the international. Mm. I mean, that was nuts. <laughs> White Lotus has got to win that. You know that that you know that's the that's the standout international series of the past of the past twelve months, and and it and it had to win. Um, I actually do think Robin Romesh did a really good job at hosting mm. it this year. It's a tough gig. Isn't it? Though you know, all of those award shows are, are are really difficult. But I thought they came across really well. There seems to be this trend at the moment as well for cutting away and doing backstage mm, interviews mm. and things like that. And I, I I I kind of I slightly question the value of those. If I'm if I'm honest, I think at the film awards, it, it, you know, the, there wasn't an awful lot to be gained from it. Um, they're trying to innovate and try and do things mm. differently, but I'm not sure it really feels like you're going sort of behind the scenes. It's just literally you've won. How do you feel? You, you know, that, without any disrespect to <laughs> any of the interviewers, it, I, I'm just not sure it adds a lot. People, they you know, they go on for a long time. It, it's about pace and keeping things going. I mean, the main thing we watch award shows for is the hope for a disaster. I mean, that that's it really. That someone falls over. That someone's drunk. That's the main excitement of a live. Yeah, and uh, the reaction service. of the losers. Mm. I mean, I was watching it with my two teenage daughters and they were saying like, you know, somebody wins and they immediately, they have about three seconds of the person going up to collect the award and then they bounce around all the people and you're looking for them and some people do it really well. I noticed a couple of people turning to whoever they were with saying, oh, that was really well deserved. I didn't really <laughs> want it. You know, um, Lucy Beaumont actually... Uh, did a really good reaction because she looked at the camera and mouthed, I'm not happy about that, <laughs> when she lost out on, I think, female comedy performer or something like that. Um, but yeah, you're looking you're looking for the car crash moment these days. I must admit, I quite like it when someone really does just can't believe that they've been <laughs> robbed and is not disguising it at all because it's probably what some of us are yeah. at home are feeling. How did you give it to that show? <laughs> <laughs> what, what on Eurovision that the the French act did not do very well and it was very clear that she was unhappy by this and was definitely not playing along uh, for the spirit of the show. Um, speaking about the Best International Award, that was presented by Harriet Dyer and Patrick Brammel of Colin from Accounts. Have Brilliant. you been watching Colin from Accounts? I absolutely binged it over yeah, one weekend. Too. It's fantastic. I, I can't recommend it enough. Everyone should watch it if you haven't already. It's great, isn't it, Ian? I, I, uh, I, as I said, I just come back from America. I watched one episode on the plane on the way back and thought it was sensational and came back and watched the entire series all in one go. <laughs> it's brilliant. They are, I think they are a real-life yeah, real yeah, couple, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And that chemistry is superb. She is brilliant. He is self-deprecating and natural and, uh, you know... The 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 dog and the I mean it, it's just it's genius I think it's one of the breakout hits of the last five years I would say it's brilliant so if you haven't seen it it's on a BBC iPlayer uh, and you can catch up with the whole thing there uh, something that was confirmed on Monday and something we touched on uh, in the show last week uh, Vice Media has filed for bankruptcy as lenders ready to buy the company's assets for about two hundred twenty five million bear in mind it was valued at about five billion uh, at the height of their fame slash infamy. Um, Ian, have you been following what's been happening with Vice? Because they put, did a decent push into news and, and telly news yeah, as well. I think it's a real shame. I think um, the demise of Vice and BuzzFeed is sad mm. for journalism. And, you know, a combination of changing viewer habits, the digital advertising downturn, the funding model. I think it's, I, I think it's a real shame. I mean, I think it goes back to the point that you know, quality journalism costs, mm. it, you know, it, it, it costs a lot of money. Some of the things that are doing well in that in that area with those particular um, uh, sort of companies is is investigations. 
investigations require two things time and money you can't put pressure on them and and you have to invest in them um i think it's i think it's a real shame um you know it i guess it kind of shows that you know all the excitement about startups was was genuine and justified and it seems like you know it is retreating to the sort of the old established uh, companies and models um that are that are surviving and doing well um, but yeah, I, it's not great. Well, Adam, it's not like the desire to reach younger audiences has gone away at all. Has just the the money run out to to keep trying? I think yeah, it, it feels like unfortunately the business model they were using just it, it's shifting along too much. Funny enough, I'm reading um, Ben Smith, who was uh, his his latest book called Traffic. He was um, he started mm. Buzzfeed Buzzfeed News, in fact, and. Um, was at Politico and most recently New York Times and now has Semaphore and the you know what was clear at the time you know when BuzzFeed was in its heyday you know remember the dress you know which was easily (laughs) the biggest BuzzFeed story of all time you know they were rapidly turning on new servers and so on and that was driven by Facebook Mm. and they were really in with Facebook and you know they would call them up and talk to the engineers over there and work out and you know the rise of Facebook and the rise of BuzzFeed kind of mirror one another. And then Facebook, well, you know, we know it's it's an older thing now. It's different and the, they'll change their algorithm and suddenly they're not generating the traffic to you and suddenly the model's changing. Mm. And arguably we're going to see that again as we move into this AI th- sort of period where if I type a search into Google, Google's maybe going to tell me the answer and not even send me to a page where I find the answer, which will change again everyone's business models because I'm reliant on that advertising traffic or somehow getting me to your site where you're going to in one way or the other monetize me. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is, or it feels to me we're seeing is we've seen these business models move on quite rapidly and we're not seeing the companies, unfortunately, be able to keep up with Mm. that. So what was a great business model five years ago suddenly isn't just working today. And, you know, there were probably other problems there, I think, with Vice. Mm. I think it's probably safe to say, but um, that's probably part of it. Uh, Okay, thanks both. Uh, Time uh, before we go for the media quiz. Now, I'm not entirely sure what I've done to produce a Matt, but he's given me somewhat of a challenge and I think it's to promote the fact that you can now watch the media podcast uh, on YouTube uh, so he's decided that today's media quiz will be charades on the radio uh, and, <laughs> make a good podcast. and I am forced to to, to do this so um, uh, you're going to do all the charades I'm going to do all the charades okay, so you're, you're both very lucky you've got just a buzz in uh, with your name if you can guess uh, what I'm suggesting to you so um, Ian you'll say Ian uh, Adam you'll say Adam right here we go. So it's maybe some silence on the podcast. Catch up on the YouTube channel. Just search The Media Podcast on YouTube to find it. Uh, right, I'm going to do... The whole thing. Good. Right. Um, Sorry, Ian, the whole thing. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Uh, Harry and Meghan, oh, paparazzi. Oh. Uh, I'm afraid you've got to buzz in. Oh, Ian, Ian. Harry and Meghan. Harry, Meghan. <laughs> yes. <that's laughs> the, uh, you, do you want to describe uh, how I... Uh, suggested that to you well you were you, you, you were driving fairly <laughs> erratically it, it would seem and you were also trying to take pictures while you were doing it there we go my excellent excellent work there um i mean are we seeing history repeat itself with harry and Meghan? i don't know and i think what i do think is really worrying about that whole story is that you know something happens something clearly happened their spokesperson puts out um a statement the NYPD puts out a statement, but immediately there is so much backlash and opinion about it without letting, you know, viewers or listeners decide. You know, clearly there was an issue The perhaps were involved. It may or may not have been extremely frightening, traumatic, whatever. We don't know exactly what happened, but immediately there's this, you know, kind of they're exaggerating, they're lying, it's not true. And and I think that's that's not good that's not great there was a, there's immediately this this sort of horrible kind of you know a, you know assumptions speculation suspicion about the whole thing rather that you know if that was anyone else that would be there was an incident they say this the police say this there you go it's that should be factual reporting and it's not factual it's been it's been sullied, I think, by opinion and presumption and quite unsavoury kind of 
comments. I don't even think it's been journalism in some cases. Okay, a point to Ian. Uh, question number two. <sighs> uh, oh. Whole thing. Whole thing. Right. thing. It- Texting, throwing away money. Twitter. Ian Twitter. Elon Musk. New CEO. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, oh, yeah, it is. NBC Universal. Uh, what's her name? The new ad executive who's come over from NBC yes, Universal. Yes, yeah. I, I will take that as uh, I'll give Adam the point there. So Twitter does have a new CEO, uh, Linda uh, Yaccarino, starting soon. Um, and my uh, obviously my description there was Elon saying he will tweet whatever he wants, even if he loses money. All right. that, that was what I was trying to describe. I don't think the mime was, <laughs> was in any way representative of that. It just it looked ridiculous. Well, definitely no, no point for you. On I mean, that he one. probably will lose money by tweeting, but yeah. Uh, what do you think is in um, uh, Linda's uh, intray when she gets into the uh, Making a lot of friends with the advertising community. Mm. I mean, by the sound of things, um, she was really popular with the New York ad community, I think. Um, and so in that sense, it's a strong hire. Um, I don't think anyone who uses Twitter can doubt that the quality of the advertising has gone down mm. in recent months. You see some very odd adverts popping up. I certainly do in my feed. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of rebuilding they need to do about the product and get users back on. And, you know, who knows, you know, the, the whole kind of subscription thing and what people are getting for subscription. I mean, there's there's a lot, um, which we probably can't do in a media <laughs> quiz at the end. But definitely getting advertisers back on because I'm sure it's still hemorrhaging money um, and you they need ads because that's the surest way of bringing revenues in. I mean, Ian, media journalism, we've all been sort of obsessed with Twitter for the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, I see less tweets now. I mean, I'm still sort of obsessed by it, but there is less going on now, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in the TV industry, we have over the past 10 years looked at Twitter as a kind of a barometer for opinion. Certainly, if if you've made a programme and you're at home watching it go out and you've got to, mm. to wait till the next morning for the overnights, you're looking at Twitter and it's like, are we trending, are we not? It's not a barometer these mm. days for, for viewers. You can be trending really well and have terrible ratings and, and vice versa. It's It's... It's not the product that it once was, and it's very important that if they want it to have a future that they sort that out. I think it's still somewhere where you find out what's going on quickly. I think journalists still use Mm. it a lot. Whether they're just talking to other journalists is is another (laughs) question, and you can still... Because we have... There isn't that live... I don't think any of the other platforms really have that live, this is happening now if I want to see what's happening. But I completely get it's not a true reflection of the population of a whole. It's definitely a very specific subsection. Interestingly, my daughters, 15 Mm. and 16, you know, TikTok is not just, you know, I think people of my age, um, and I may well have had this conversation in my own home, have, you know, kind of wrote off TikTok as just why are you just watching just people, you know, lip syncing or doing makeup tutorials and things like that. They are getting their news through TikTok and they are and, and they are interested enough to cherry pick the stories which are coming out of TikTok and then go away and Mm. find it and mine other sources for it which I think is interesting and you know that that is adapting we need to adapt to the way that younger people are consuming information but then you know are sensible and smart enough to go off and find you know properly verified stories Uh, well there's a lot of data isn't there actually that people use TikTok as a search engine and it's it's not a bad search engine is it yeah you say that, I don't know, I don't really use TikTok. <laughs> Adam, but disappointed. Well, I know, it just, it, it, it could get me started about this. I didn't like the algorithm. And they, I know they were going to do that grand reset thing that you could completely reset your profile because I was seeing videos I did not want to see and I just could not unlike them enough to get rid of them. <laughs> um, but no, no, people, absolutely people do. And I think that there, there is this wider thing of actually, you know, bigger concern of the open web and the closed sort of web that people sit on a platform. And actually the idea of even opening a browser to certain young people, mm. I think, is is a bit of an anathema because you live in TikTok and you do search on TikTok. And of course you will find an answer of sorts. There's enough on there that you will find something. Uh, right, question number three. So it's point each so far. <sighs> The whole Whole thing. thing. Singing. Eurovision. No. Uh, You're uh, You're watching. 
Oh, was this the number of Eurovision viewers? Adam. Adam. <laughs> yes. There were a lot of them. There was. Yeah. Um, Eurovision final is the most watched ever. Well, most watched recently as far back as the current methodology seems to be. Yeah, I'm sure that sometime in the 1970s, <laughs> there, when there was nothing else to watch, most people were watching it. Uh, did you watch? No. Uh, Ian, did you watch? I hate it. <laughs> Oh God! I thought it was quite good. I thought we did. I thought the BBC did a good job. I think the BBC did do a yeah. good job. I don't hate the production. I thought they did a fantastic <laughs> job. Hannah Waddingham was the was yeah, the smash hit star. star of that whole thing, and Mel and her milk churning was fabulous. But <laughs> Eurovision, I, I just, I just, I just hate it. It's just, <laughs> it's just, I don't. It's rubbish, isn't it? I don't mind got Australia it, in it. The fact that it say. exists is not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy the fact that many, many people watch it, like a number of reality shows that I don't watch. <laughs> and, that I, you know, the quality in it. But no, I mean, it, it, you know, musically, it's not to my taste, shall we say? Well, on that bombshell, uh, thank you uh, both uh, for, for being here. Um, uh, Adam, you are our winner. Congratulations. Uh, you get, to, as a, a special prize, you get to go off and pick next year's Eurovision entrant for, the, for Britain. Well done. Uh, uh, <laughs> good luck well you, you wait till you see what I'd pick <laughs> uh, and so how can people keep up uh, with uh, your work uh, you can find me at Adam Bowie obviously not on TikTok um, or adambowie.com uh, Ian uh, I am on Twitter at IJ Rumsey I think um, you can watch my Netflix account if you like I'll give you my password if you, if you for want. the next few months anyway. yeah exactly uh, but yeah pleasure to be here uh, lovely. Uh, great to see you both. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we're recording at the very classy, yet easy to use, uh, London podcast studios in central London, complete with a full HD fix rig uh, and a bowl of suite at the entrance. Uh, we highly recommend them. Book your next recording here. That's thelondonpodcaststudios.com. There's a link in the show notes.